Welcome to the motherfucking Weasley Update. Yeah, I'm gonna start singing it from now on. Can't think of a bunch of creative ways to do it, but uh, I'm Aiden Weiss. I am not fucked up, and I'm still ready to ramble. It is sober October for me and some of my friends. That is a direct call out. Um, and honestly, it's been going, uh, going pretty smooth. You know, I did it last year and last year, cause I am, anyone who knows me knows that I am a motherfucking marijuana fiend. Um, and I have never used it, not, and I don't mean this in a judgmental way, but I have never, uh, used it as like a mechanism. Yes. I'm recording a podcast, bitch. What do you need? Oh, man. You find... What are you looking for? Oh, yeah. I I got, like, OCD about that box of grub today for some reason, and so I reorganized it a little bit. So they could totally be in there. Anyways, yeah, I, uh, I've never used it as, like, a mechanism for, um, for, like, sleeping or anxiety or anything. I just fucking love weed. Oh, God, my phone's all smudged. I'm going to wipe this off real quick. God damn it. That's what I get for fucking eating corn dogs and gumbo when trying to fucking queue up videos. God damn it, I'm going to have to deal with that later. Anyways, never used it as like a mechanism to cope for anything. I just fucking love weed. Um, but you, there is no one on this planet who can smoke weed at the rate at which I smoke weed and not be mentally addicted to it on some level. So last year it was really about uh, just proving to myself that I could because the longest tolerance break I had taken, oh, excuse me, no, that's, that's not the right verbiage because it wasn't a tolerance break, so to speak. But the last break I took from weed before that was when I was like a senior in high school in 2017 and that was three weeks. So, um, yeah, so last year it was really about just proving myself that I could go a month without smoking. And for me, it's not even necessarily sober October as much as it is no weed until Halloween. And last year it was perfect because I didn't have work or school on Halloween. And I had this whole fucking thing mapped out, dude. First of all, I'm pretty, uh, I am pretty over the top when it comes to cleaning my, my shit, you know, my, my bong, bowl piece, ash catcher, all that jazz. So I had it perfectly fucking cleaned. But also, if you know anything ab- about getting stoned, uh, eating, like just gorging on food kills your high. And so I knew that, um, I was going to have to like get a bunch of food in me before I smoked for that first time again on Halloween. Cause I didn't want to like smoke and then eat everything in my house and totally ruin, you know, my first time back. So, uh, so I got up, worked out, ate some oatmeal with blueberries and bananas and, um, got everything the the week leading up to that point, I like busted ass extra hard Monday through Wednesday, just so I could basically have the whole day to myself. And I got so, so fucking stoned and just listened to music and, um, and actually, I came up with the idea for Finale uh, Legend Remix, which is one of my favorite songs I've ever I've ever made. So at least for that, uh, that reason alone, it, it was worth it. I was like listening to an older song I did that was a remix of another older song I did. And I was like, I need to end Legend this way. So, come on. Are you also looking for the breadcrumbs? Well, as I was telling Ryder, I sort of was OCD earlier about that box while I was working out, so I, like, reorganized it a little bit. Um, yeah, and so, uh, I was listening to that song, the Stranger Things remix, and I was just like, fuck, Legend needs to end this way. And I am so grateful for that break, because I fucking love that song. Um, ooh, I need to cross this off of my to-do list. I've got a fat to-do list every day, and if I didn't, I don't know what I'd do with myself. Because just the dopamine rush I get from crossing something off of that list is, it's better than sex. Did you hear the hesitation in my voice as the word sex came out? That's because it's not actually better than sex, but it's pretty, pretty damn fucking close. Speaking of my music, you know, 
I, I'm actually not going to say it because I don't want this fucking podcast to just be me plugging my my creative projects. But I will say I'm officially on streaming services and I am super, super fucking pumped about it. It was a lot of work and just a lot of research on uh, on how to get that distributed. But, um, but like I said, I don't, I don't want this to sound like I'm trying to fucking plug my other creative projects. So I'm going to move on to something I've talked about many times on this podcast. And that is Logan starring Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart, and I believe the girl who plays Laura is named Daphne Keene, um, but god damn it, that's my favorite movie of all time, it is so fucking good, I was just watching some clips from that while I was eating, and god fucking damn, oh my god, what sort of bug is that, there is the grossest bug climbing up the screen of my window right now, I'm gonna try to blow on it, Oh, yeah, that disturbed it for sure. <laughs> Hold up. Let's just poke the screen a little bit. Get out of here, you little fucker. Oh, you're so nasty looking. Yeah, get out of here. Mm. Oh, my God. There it went. Yep, that thing's probably dead. Yeah, anyways, that goddamn movie's so good. It was everything a Wolverine fan would want. Just the gore, the opening scene alone. I'm going to get into spoilers here, so spoiler alert if you haven't seen Logan. But god fucking damn it, that opening scene where the people are are trying to uh, loot his car a little bit, trying to pop the fucking wheels off or some shit like that, and he just starts ripping into them. Just that fucking four minutes alone. When you start, you're like, yes, this is what I've wanted for 17 years of Hugh Jackman playing this character. And not to say that, like, any other scenes of his weren't satisfying. Like, dude, in X2, when he is ripping through the fucking mansion, taking out all... Oh, my God. I love that line, too, when he's, like, getting the kids out of there and Colossus is like, I can help you. In an alternate universe, we get to see Colossus and him fight side by side. And I bet that scene would have been so fucking dope, but it is insanely dope as is plus you got sean ashmore in there playing Iceman, which is hilarious because he played a fire-based character on the boys this last season um of course you got the lovely anna paquin god damn it she is so so awesome here's what i will say though rogue comparatively not not isolated in the fox x-men universe but rogue comparatively to her source material counterpart is a huge letdown in a giant pussy i mean like in in the comics and like the show i grew up watching she's flying around she perpetually has flight and super strength and durability and she's just she's also a sassy badass you know like rogue was and again rogue the the version of rogue that anna paquin played in the fox movies was perfect for what they were going for but uh but she was just so timid and like scared of her powers and the rogue i grew up on was a fucking sassy mouth bitch running around kicking everyone's ass and she was just so goddamn charismatic and lovable and uh god damn it her always talking shit to gambit when he's trying to make a move fuck me i want to see i just want to see gambit and rogue interact in any form in a live action medium whether that's in movies or a disney plus series give me some fucking gambit and give me some goddamn rogue and i want to see gambit flirt with rogue and i want to see her shoot his ass down with some sassy ass remarks and then fly away that that was like how it went every time they'd be driving around in his nice red car he'd say some shit in his fucking sexy ass cajun accent and she would just ha- have enough and dip out god i loved that confidence she was such a dope character and if i'm not mistaken she got her powers of flight and like all that other shit from captain marvel she like absorbed captain marvel's powers and captain marvel was like hospitalized for so long and you know, don't quote me on this. I think I'm, I I might be getting some of this wrong. But uh, but if memory serves me right, that's how she gets those powers. Which I'm hoping is what happens in the next Captain Marvel. Because there were some rumors that Rogue would be in Captain Marvel too, And that she would be the first X-Men to appear. And fuck me, if that played out on screen, I, 
I will suck the dick of who, whoever came up with that idea. Because, like I said, I, I want to see that badass, like, doesn't take shit from any one version of Rogue so bad. But, uh, like I said, the Anna Paquin version is perfect for, for those movies. Especially the first one, because, again, if I remember right, it, that movie, like, centered around Magneto using her powers to, uh... I think he was trying to make, like, everyone mutants. Man, Mag Magneto is such a compelling character. Xavier, too, but... Dude, just just the the flashback scenes of him in internment camps and oh my fucking god! And Michael Fassbender playing the young version of his him, dude. One of my favorite movies in comic book history is in, uh, maybe even film history. Like certainly lower on the list, but definitely, I I definitely feel comfortable saying it would be on my list of top five seventy top seventy five favorite scenes ever. Um. Spoiler alert, I'm, I've just been railing off spoilers, but spoiler alert if you haven't seen uh, uh, First Class, X-Men First Class. Also, because I didn't say it before, this is episode 6 and it is the 14th of October 2020. Anyways, it's like um, basically the whole premise of Magneto's story is he's going after... Uh, the dude who killed his parents in that internment camp, who was played by Kevin Bacon. Fucking love me some Kevin Bacon. And, um, excuse me, I believe his character's name is Sebastian Shaw. And, uh, long story short, Magneto goes into a bar, and there's three people hanging out in this bar, and, um, and he sees on the wall a picture of these three people with Kevin Bacon's character. And, uh, and ju the dialogue alone in this scene is so fucking awesome. And I, I think they're speaking German. Definitely not something I can fucking understand or recognize. But given the context of his origins, I believe it's German. And so he, like, strikes up a conversation with these people and asks them what they do. Oh, I'm a pig farmer. Oh, I'm a tailor. Blah, blah, blah. And they're like, what's your family's name? He's like, my family doesn't have a name. It was taken by pig farmers and tailors and they oh my god you just gotta watch it because it there's no amount of me talking about it that can convey how tense a fucking moment it is for, first class is for sure one of the best x-men movies but again x2 aside from that goddamn scene where wolverine is tearing through the mansion one of the best action sequences in film history is in my opinion is nightcrawler tearing through the white house the, the fucking music, the puff of smoke as he disappears. I mean, holy shit. Talk about a tense action scene. God damn it. It's just from a filmmaking standpoint. What a, what a great scene. And fuck, who played Nightcrawler? He was in Spy Kids. I think his name is Alan. Uh, oh my God, I can't believe him. I'm blanking on this. I want to say Alan Tudyk, but that's the pirate guy from Dodgeball. I'm looking this up right now. Who plays Nightcrawler in X2? Alan Cumming. God damn it. I can't believe I couldn't get that. Man, he's he is fantastic. Let's let's see what else is on his uh his IMDb. God damn, he was born in 1965. Son of the Mask, Pfft. Golden Eye, Briar Pat. You know, not a lot of stuff. I've seen him in Doctor Who. That's something I should start. Um, Queers, After Louis. Yeah, I, I honestly, Dora. Yeah, I really haven't even heard of a lot of this shit, but uh, but that is not to say that he's not the shit. Man, IMDb used to be bookmarked on my on my downstairs computer because I would just spend all day looking at movie theories and shit. And fuck me, you know. Speaking of Anna Paquin, I feel like I should throw in how awesome True Blood is. If anyone out there has not watched True Blood on HBO, it's definitely worth a shot. It it suffered from the same fate as Game of Thrones, where the last two seasons were just not great. But um. But definitely not to the same extent. I mean, this podcast can should basically be changed to the shitting on season eight of Game of Thrones podcast. No, oh, no, we got a crying baby in the background. 
Oh no, I hope she's okay. Anyways, uh, True Blood is like a vampire werewolf, werepanther, fairy thing, which I know turns a lot of people off, but it's very different in the sense of, um, it's, it's not like a secret society of vampires. They're out of the coffin, they say, in that, uh, in that cinematic realm. And, um, and the idea is that true blood is like this synthetic blood you can get at bars and stuff to drink so they don't have to um, drink human blood. But they still totally do because true blood is just ass. But like they'll go into a bar and be like, uh, a positive, please. Do you want that warm or cold? It's fucking really weird. And it's also set in the South. Um, lots of charming characters. Lots of representation, too, now that I think about it. In terms of just, like, queer characters. Uh, characters of color. And that was... I wasn't allowed to watch Game of Thrones and True Blood when they first started. Like, because I remember the first this is so weird the the first episode of true blood premiered when i was in the fourth grade and i remember because i came back from football practice super late and um and was eating dinner and my parents were watching it and i just had to not face the tv because it was so not only is it just graphic in terms of the gore but uh lots of lots of fucking sex stuff going on in that show and like when people strip down and change into a werewolf they don't change back and like magically have clothes on you know so there's lots of uh lots of asses in that show but actually in like the fall i might have talked about this on here already in the fall i just remembered this character oh excuse me his name is russell edgington and he is the gay vampire king of louisiana And he is such a fucking great character that I just remembered that character existed. And I looked up the first episode that he premiered in and watched the show from the second he premiered to the second he was no longer in the show. Which, spoiler alert, is indicative of the fact that he dies. Although, I'm not quite sure I remember how. That's another thing I'm going to look up just for my own curiosity. Come on. Okay. How did Russell Edgington die? Yep, that already came up. Let's see. Oh, it was a... I knew fucking Eric Northman had something to do with it. Let's see. Oh my god, there was that scene too where he fucked... Sorry, that was probably loud. God damn, the rain is loud. That. Oh my god, it's hailing, that's why. Man, it is pissing outside all of a sudden. That's crazy. Yeah, there was also a great scene where he just comes on a fucking... The middle of a newscast, rips a guy's spine out, and spews some terrorist rhetoric. It's so, so amazing. God damn it, what a great character. Yeah, True Blood is definitely worth watching. Anna Paquin is the lead, and I just love hearing shit like this. She went on to marry her love interest from that show in real life. Um, I, I don't know his real name, but his name is Bill Compton in the show, and her name is Sookie. I just love, there's always these little, he would always just be like, Sookie, Sookie. Plus, like I was saying earlier, Lafayette, god damn it, what a fucking great character too. I, I might have to go back and uh, watch that again, but... It just sucks knowing the last two seasons suck. Same with the Game of Thrones. I've been watching a bunch of just, like, clips on YouTube. And the last season sucked so bad that you forget how incredible everything else was. Like, it it would have dethroned Breaking Bad as the best show of all time if that season was as good as the worst season leading up to that point. I mean, just some of the dialogue, like when Jamie Lannister is in the bathtub with Brienne of Tarth and he's explaining, uh, he's explaining, like, why he killed the Mad King. Oh my god. So awesome. Any dialogue with Tywin Lannister? What a fucking beautifully written character. So savage and vile and just sophisticated. <clears throat> god damn it, he was. He's got to be one of the best characters ever written for TV. Up there with Gus Fring from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. And, to- oh my god, that dude was on The Boys too. That is a perfect segue. The Boys on Amazon Prime. 
just the season two finale was the best, and this is no exaggeration, the best season finale I've ever fucking seen to a show. I mean, I'm, I am balls deep in that show anyway, because I just love it so much. Obviously, I'm a big nerd for superhero shit, but that show really is uh, a satire in many ways of that stuff. I mean, not only they're ripping on Scientology, they're ripping on big corporate studios like Disney. I mean, like that cringy moment in Endgame that was so... Fu- and here's the thing, I- I'm not against like like feminist moments in movies by any fucking means, but like the that moment in Endgame, we all know what I'm talking about, so forced and so cringy. Like that moment, they should have had a moment like that, but it was just so so forced and they ripped on it so hard this season of the boys and not only did they rip on it they had a scene where girls step in where the boys are rendered useless and girls step in and start kicking ass that was not only was it not forced not only was it not cringy it was so goddamn awesome i literally shot out of my bed and was like yes are you sorry that was loud too it's like yes are you fucking kidding me God damn it, that show just nails it every time. And the the rips on Scientology were just, um, I mean, they were pretty obvious to begin with, but they only got more and more on the nose with this, like, Church of the Collective stuff. Because as soon as they came in, I was like, this feels very much like like they're ripping on Scientology. And then at one point, again, spoiler alert, they're asking someone like, Hey, what do you think about Eagle the archer? And he's like, Oh, he's a great dude. Got me into the church, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, the guy's like, he's been speaking out against the church. He's a toxic personality. Don't talk to him, which is just so, so on. And even later, someone quits the church and is like, I didn't even laugh when you guys said we were lizard people. And I mean, like there are so many corporate heads that are pulling their hair out, watching that that goddamn show. I mean, it's so on the nose that they've even got a character that is basically AOC. I mean, not not even just within the context of the show, but when you watch the cast members talk about that character, they they like jokingly refer to her as AOC and then are like, "Oh, I mean, uh fuck, what's her name? It's Victoria Newman, I think." Because in the comics it was a dude named Victor. Same with uh, same with Stormfront. Stormfront this season in the comics was also a dude. Um, I'm not sure why they gender bent either characters, but it works so goddamn well. I mean, I actually can't imagine Stormfront as a, a male character because I think her name is like Aya Cash or something. The, the woman who played her did so fucking good. I mean, not she was compelling when she needed to be. She was annoying as fuck when she needed to be. She was despicable at time. I mean, really killed it. And same, I've always thought Homelander was good. I fuck. What's his name? Fuck me. I saw some fan art of him as Wolverine, and it was actually really, really good. Fuck me. What is that guy's name? I was just looking at an Instagram post of his. I think, oh no, so Anthony Starr, and um, man, uh, particularly in this last episode, there there was a moment where I was like, man, give this guy an award of some sort. I don't care if it's an Emmy or like I just something because he was fucking nailing it. I mean, there was a moment where he was talking to his son, and it was so good. Like he drew you in so hard, you sort of forgot that the whole rest of the show, he was a terrible piece of shit. And, uh, and you're reminded pretty quickly after that, but, uh, but man, he fucking killed it this season. Everyone in that show is good. Everyone. Dude, when, um, fuck, what's her name? I just know in the comics, her name is the female. Uh, Oh my god, I can't believe I'm just blanking on names left and right today. I'm usually so good about this shit. But uh, but when the female's um, live-action counterpart goes in and literally rips someone's face off like she's a chimp, I mean, they pushed the, the gore this season so, so hard. Not, I mean, the first season was insanely gory, and that was part of the appeal to me. 
Um, but God, this this season they they pushed it even harder. Oh shit! I should put this on uh, on airplane mode. Is that gonna kill this? Nope. All right, we're we're still rolling. Yeah, the the boys is just crazy, crazy good. And um, I I even hesitate to tell people it's a superhero thing, because it is so so different from from anything you've ever seen i mean it's it's grounded in the sense that the superheroes feel like real people like they're not these outrageously moral like impossibly virtuous god damn it these screaming fucking kids (laughs) jesus christ anyways they're not like impossibly virtuous they're awful terrible they're fucking murderers they're rapists they're drug addicts i mean it's fucking and it, you know I, I don't like throwing in drug addicts with murderers and rapists because they're not even that's a whole different conversation but they're not even on the the same tier of of thing like i i have a lot of uh, a lot of sympathy for addicts and i, I don't want to sound like i'm villainizing them by uh by any extent but fuck me they just do it so well like they're all run by pr groups which you know i as a pr student i am definitely i definitely like seeing that shit because like where my mind has always gone from the second i've entered the pr program was uh was like the the public image shit the apology shit like when someone says homophobic homophobic shit or racist shit someone else has to concoct a fucking fake ass apology which is like for me a weird place to be in because uh hold on i gotta drink some water because um i don't want to work with people like that obviously like murder like fucking homophobes and racists i mean like it makes me think of that amber heard shit like so many people are like she shouldn't be an aquaman too and other people are like well they should separate her private life from her career and it's like dude what other job would you hire a known domestic abuser other than hollywood or the entertainment industry i mean because like think about sports i feel like there's lots of domestic abuse within the the sports realm you hear about that all the time just the entertainment industry in in general it's pretty despicable and that sounds hypocritical from someone who is obviously trying to enter that field but fuck dude some of the shit you hear about is just like that that can't be real and it it is i don't mean that as like you know like denying what's going on it's just like some of the shit you hear about what people are doing in the entertainment industry is so goddamn ridiculous it is it's unbelievable I mean, people jerking off in front of people. That's not even, all things considered, some of the shit I've heard about Hollywood. That is not that fucking weird. And that says a lot, that jerking off in front of people is not weird comparatively to some of the other things going on. I mean, fuck me, man. Oh, my God. Anyways, I don't know how I got from The Boys to that, but... Oh, the PR shit, but if you haven't watched The Boys check it out immediately because it is so so good now you have two seasons you can binge um plus jensen ackles of supernatural is joining the next season love me some jensen ackles he he voiced uh red hood and batman under the red hood and i was always hoping he would go on to play that character but now he's too old nor do i think they're gonna adapt the red hood storyline anytime soon which is tragic because that could be done as a solo movie, let alone just a uh, a Batman movie. Which, again, is a great segue into The Batman, starring Robert Pattinson, Zoe Kravitz, Colin Farrell, Paul Dano. I, I, I'm not even ashamed of not knowing this guy's name because I've never known it, but he was in the Transformers movie. I'm going to look it up. He's playing Carmine Falcone. Ah, oh, shit, i got to turn my phone off airplane mode. Okay, um... The Batman, Carmine, Falcone, John Turturro? Let's see what else he was in. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. Yeah, let's see what else. Oh, he's in the Big Lebowski. I forgot about that. Oh, brother, where art thou? He's actually in quite a bit of shit. 
Um, but he looks fantastic. I mean, some set pictures came out the other day where he's got the three scars on his face uh, from the long Halloween storyline, which rumors have been saying for a long time this uh, this Batman movie is adapting. And there was some other evidence to, to point to that. Um, but fuck me, dude. And he was sitting alongside Zoe Kravitz, who, if I'm not mistaken, you know, Catwoman, who she's playing, is the one who gives him those fucking scars. And so I wonder if, one, she's playing his daughter. That's one thing I saw thrown around. Don't know, don't really believe that. But I was thinking more she is playing, like, a love interest of his who is secretly breaking into his place and stealing his shit and using using his connections to uh to fuck him over basically because you uh, again something that seemed very long halloween in the trailer for the batman you see her breaking into the mayor's vault to get something and batman also pops in there and they have a uh, what looks to be like a little duel and that is straight out of the long halloween I've talked about this movie a little bit before on the podcast, but certainly not to the extent that I want to. Because within the first 24 hours of that trailer coming out, and this is not an exaggeration, I watched it at least 100 times. At least. I was in the Edgewick Inn parking lot when it came out, and I just sat in my car and watched it, texting everyone I knew. Have you seen the Batman trailer? Oh my god. As soon as it opens up with the Riddler fucking taping that dude up, It's like, ooh, what is this? Then you get into Something in the Way by Nirvana. What a tone-setting song. I mean, here was my biggest takeaway. When I watched that trailer, it looked like a Seven movie. Again, if you haven't seen Seven, starring Brad Pitt, Kevin Spacey, and Morgan Freeman, it's on HBO Max right now. You gotta fucking watch that movie. It's excellent what's in the box Ah, so fucking good but yeah it basically felt like seven with batman just the the crime scene and like how it's obviously like the murder and presumably murders are being played out to show how corrupt gotham is and not just some mindless shit fucking a that looks awesome and also uh his the riddler's mask looks very zodiac which get this I just watched Zodiac. That's got Robert Downey Jr., Jake Gyllenhaal, and Mark Ruffalo. I'm trying to think. I feel like there was someone else big in that that was worth noting. But anyways, it's obviously about the Zodiac Killer. And I didn't know the Zodiac Killer was real. I thought it was a fictitious thing until I watched that movie. Excellent, by the way. Definitely got to give it a shot. And, um... You know, it it wraps up with, like, and this happened to this person, and this person went on to do this. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. This is fucking real? There was a person who actually committed these heinous acts? Oh, my God. Some some of the shit they show is so... Not even, like, outright gory, but just so intense in, in its graphic nature. I mean, particularly stabbing scenes. There was one... Spoiler alert, there's a scene where you see him just repeatedly stab a chick in the torso. It's just fucking hard to watch, man. I grew up on horror and shit like that, and that scene was hard to watch, for sure. But, uh, yeah, I'm grateful I watched that movie, because it was, um, it was really entertaining. I, I'm, that sort of made me, that's what prompted me to watch Seven again, actually. Because I'd seen it before, but it had been a while, but... After watching Zodiac, I was just like, ooh, some murder mystery shit. Because I've never been, uh, I've been, I've always been indifferent about that genre. Like, it's never captivated me super hard, but it's also never let me down, if that makes any sense. Um, I don't know, there was this movie Identity with John Cusack, and that is really good all the way up until the twist. Uh, spoiler alert if you haven't seen that, um, it's basically, you watch this whole, it's also got Ray Liotta, you watch this whole thing play out, and you're like, oh my god, who's the murderer, and then you find out it's all just happening in some dude's head, and he's got, like, multiple personality disorder, or some shit like that, and all the different, uh, identities, 
are just fighting for control, and that's what you just watched unravel. Really, really let... I mean, what a letdown twist. But uh, everything else about that movie is fucking really good. I mean, some of the shit is... Yeah, I, I might... That might be worth watching again, just... um, Because I, I remember I took notes, because at the time, I was writing a horror project, and my parents were like, yeah, you've got to watch Identity and take notes on that. Um, around that same time, I remember I started John Wick by happenstance, and when he gets into that dialogue, the the Russian dude about, like... He's like, we called him blah, blah, blah. And Theon Greyjoy is like, I'm not scared of the boogeyman. And he's like, he's not the boogeyman. He's who you send to kill the fucking boogeyman. I, I paused it and went and grabbed that notepad. That I was... Because I'm trying to think what other movies I... I was taking notes on, but there there was just, like, a period of time when I was working on a horror project where I was watching a bunch of, uh, a bunch of movies and taking notes, and I just had to pause right then and there, because I was like, that is so awesome, I need to be writing this down. To this day, I think that is some fucking crazy awesome dialogue, and w- what a reversal of the protagonist role, like, s- like, setting up the the because if you just isolated that scene and gave no context you would think that they were the good guys and john wick was the bad guy just the way they they villainize him and make you terrified of him man i I still need to see two and three i can't believe i I haven't watched those but anyways i'm still not done sucking the batman trailer's dick because it was so fucking incredible and they've only shot 25 to 30 percent of that movie it was so good that when Robert Pattinson got COVID, I was convinced he was going to die because the Batman trailer was too good to be true. And not only the Batman trailer, but at DC Fandom, that event where they premiered the trailer, um, listening to director and writer Matt Reeves talk about it, it was just like, yes, this guy understands the character so well. Like He said something about, if Batman has a superpower, it's his ability to endure And that was enough for me to be like, I trust you, Matt. I fucking trust you. Because that is so, so goddamn true. That's the essence of Batman. Obviously, I'm a giant Batman nerd. But dude, the whole... I mean, even if you're not a Batman fan, that trailer is so... It's put together so well. Like, the music, the piano coming in when you see his boots walk into frame. like Like, it's a fucking cowboy movie. Oh, fuck me. That's so awesome. Plus, Jeffrey Wright playing Commissioner Gordon. As soon as you see him, you're like, oh, that's Gordon. And actually, he's not even Commissioner yet, and I love that, because this is a year two story. Also love that. And that's reflected in his suit, the prototype suit. Because I'll I'll tell you what, when, uh, when they first released that costume test, I was indifferent... I was like, eh, it looks cool. I like the armor look, but I, I don't know about the cowl. And then when set pictures came out of the stunt suit, I was like, that's not great. Because And here's the thing I, I had to acknowledge is stunt suits will never look as great because they're made out of different materials. They need to, you know, they need to be able to take a beating and, and like be more comfortable for stunt performances and shit like that. So, but I was just like, particularly the gauntlets, I was looking at and I was like, ooh, those gauntlets throw off the whole fucking suit. And I don't like the cowl. Like, it's too, it looks like it's made of leather. He should not have a leather fucking cowl. But actually seeing it in action, in in the lighting and the color grading that it will, that it is intended to be seen, it's indisputably, in my opinion, one of the best bat suits ever. If not the best bat suit ever. Because the the only one I can think of that, that could dethrone it, or could compete with it rather, is Ben Affleck's bat suit. And I know a lot of people don't like that one because of the big bat rider, my little brother is among them. I love that suit because I grew up on the animated series where he was just this hulking figure. And more than anything, the suit was gray. And up until Ben Affleck played Batman, there was no gray bat suits. And I think the black worked and it made sense. For the movies previously, I just wanted to see a gray bat suit. So I love Ben Affleck's bat suit, but um, 
I think that Robert Pattinson's bat suit, and this is just the prototype suit. We're almost definitely getting a second suit in that movie, which almost makes me sad because of how much I love the suit. But I think that prototype suit is about 6.7 times better than the Ben Affleck suit. I love the armor look. I fucking love it. And I think it's because, like, I I think one of the best bat suits in all media is from Batman Arkham Origins. I mean, the 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 color of the gray is perfect. The bat symbol is perfect. Just, I love that armored look. Because it makes the most sense to me. Um, but not only does the suit look incredible, he looks incredible in it. And I, I knew that was going to be the case. And I, I even knew that as soon as they showed the costume test. Because he has the best fucking Batman jawline ever. Oh my god. God, yeah, you know, I I was never, I wasn't disappointed by his casting because I just, I knew Robert Pattinson to be a fucking really good actor and uh, I know he's going to nail this fucking role, but I could talk about that suit for the whole rest of this podcast. I could, I could do a whole podcast on just that suit, not just talk about it for the rest of this podcast. I love every fucking detail. The bat symbol's dope. I love that it's metal. Like, I, I love the, uh, that gray is also the perfect color because it's not, it's like a dark enough gray that you're, you question whether or not it's black, but it's still light enough that you're like, no, 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 that, that's gray. Mm. I don't know what it is about the gray suit that, that makes me so pumped, but, uh, for starters, it makes the bat symbol stand out and I love that. But also, I mean, Colin Farrell as the penguin is unrecognizable. I was looking at set pictures yesterday and like if the Batman doesn't win an award for costume design, I, like here's the thing, the penguin reveal in that trailer was straight up like a letdown because you there was no way you knew that was Colin Farrell. It it just looked like some random fucking dude. You were like, "Oh, who is that guy and why was he important enough to highlight in this trailer? And then when he talks at the very end, it's like, oh, this guy's crazy. You're like, wait, holy shit, is that Colin Farrell? And the only confirmation I got is the, like, the, uh, whatever company, I don't even know if that's the right terminology, but whoever they outsourced to do the makeup for, like, posted on Instagram about it and someone commented and was like, we don't have any confirmation that that's Colin Farrell. And they commented and they were like, yes, that's Colin Farrell. And he was like, what are your sources? And they were like, we made the makeup. We applied it to his face. I, I mean, it's fucking crazy. Because I think Colin Farrell is one of the best looking men in Hollywood. I mean, he's so hot. Um, God damn it, I love Colin Farrell. He, he was almost Batman one time. With Jude Law as Superman. And, uh, and they make him look like a balding, fat, disgusting slob with a gross nose and a hideous scar across his face. I mean, seriously unrecognizable. The only, I mean, you just look in his eyes and you're like, that can't be Colin Farrell. And just again, I'm, I'm sure I've talked about this before, but the casting of Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman, you know, it, she's not like... That was another thing uh, um, our boy Matt Reeves said in that DC fandom thing is she's not Catwoman yet. Penguin is not the Penguin yet. He doesn't even like being called the Penguin. Uh, this is the first time the Riddler's making an appearance. So I'm not going to judge the Catwoman suit too hard because it's sort of like obviously a prototype thing. But everyone was shitting on it. And I love the sort of ski mask with just the subtle cat ears. I thought that looked great, but... Costume aside, Zoe Kravitz was probably the best choice they could have picked for that role. Mm, I can't wait for that movie. But also, and I'm probably, uh, I gotta limit myself. These will be my closing notes. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. No, they won't actually. On the trailer, what I'm gonna say is that going the route they did with the Riddler, where instead of making him this goofy, clownish, Solve all 240 of my riddles if you want to beat this game, Batman. Such a fucking stupid thing. Went to beat the Arkham Knight game, and it's like, oh, you have to solve another 175 riddles first. Fuck you. Fuck you. Are you kidding me? 
I logged in so many hours on that game. Beat all the fucking side quests. And then when I want to beat the main story, it's like, oh, sorry, you've got to do riddles? Oh, my God, that's stupid. I actually saw a great, uh, a great fucking comment on the Batman trailer that was like something to the effect of, oh, yeah, can't wait to see him have to solve 240 riddles to complete the story. Because that literally is the number in the Arkham Knight game. 240 riddles. And I think if they want to do Riddler in those games, that's great. Make that an option. But to make that a requirement to beat the game was so stupid. But anyways, that's all to say I love the route that they went with uh, with the Riddler, where he's just like a, a serial killer. I think that's going to be excellent. But these will actually be my final thoughts on the trailer. Um, the Batmobile. You've got to bring up the fucking Batmobile. It's like a fucking souped up charger. Let's see, because I'm not good with cars. I'm going to have to look that up. Da -da -da. What kind of, uh, excuse me, Jesus, car is the Batmobile? Okay, that's not right. Is the Batmobile in the Batman? No, that's for the comics. Oh, okay. Let's see, this is from a Screen Rant article. Oh my god. Robert Pattinson's... No, I shouldn't read this verbatim. It is a Plymouth Barracuda. Fuck me, that thing looks so good. Oh my god, that's hot. Yeah, I, I gotta stop talking about it, because I, I could just talk about that trailer all fucking day. So good. Um, I guess also in movie news, dude... Jamie Foxx is coming back as Electro in Spider-Man 3. When I read that, not going to lie, I was disappointed. Because I thought The Amazing Spider-Man 2 with Andrew Garfield and Jamie Foxx and, um, let's see, Dane DeHaan and Emma Stone was ass, to say the least. And I thought Jamie Foxx was the worst goddamn part of it. I thought the only good part of that movie was the last, like, f 10 minutes probably. Spoiler alert, after Gwen Stacy dies and you just see him, like, at her grave year-round. That part was great, but that movie was so ass. Um, and, like I said, I thought Jamie Foxx was the worst part. So I was like, really? They're bringing him back? But one thing, a couple things, actually, that did give me, give me hope. He posted on Instagram, in the caption, it said, I won't be blue anymore. Which is good, because... I would like to see a more comic accurate suit out of Electro. But um, secondly, his Instagram post was just a bunch of fan art of Electro. And one of the pictures was Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland. And rumors are Andrew Garfield, Dane DeHaan, uh, Tobey Maguire, and Kirsten Dunst, who played Mary Jane in the original, are all signed on for Spider-Man 3. And more recent and more reputable rumors coming out in the last couple days say Marvel has already silently cast their Miles Morales. Woo! You heard me right. Marvel, and, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Take everything I say with a grain of salt, because I'm a jackass. Um, Marvel has silently cast their Miles Morales. Oh, my God. And yesterday, see, I thought that new Spider-Man game Miles Morales was only on PS5, so every time I've seen pictures and shit for it, I just don't let myself get hyped. And my brother told me yesterday, like, no, you can, if you buy it digitally on PS4, you can get a free upgrade to the PS5. And I almost shit myself, because um, anyone who lived with me at Lark, you know who you are, fucking love you boys, uh, I logged in so much time on Spider-Man PS4, harder than any game. I've ever played in my life. I would disappear for four to six hours. And it was it was literally, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to play for a little while. Okay, I'm going to do this one side quest. Ah, but this, suit, this side quest is super close, so I'll bust that out. Dude, I had that game 100% complete. And I had everything I could possibly get done finished before I did the boss battle. So, oh my god, I can't wait for the fucking next one of those. That's going to be so goddamn awesome. 
Oh, I'm so pumped, dude. I've been, like, not letting myself get pumped because I thought I wouldn't be able to play it. Which, actually, you know, I picked up for the first time in a while that Jedi Fallen Order game. Today, just for the last, like, week, I've sort of been inspired to play it. But I've been super busy. Um, but I saw this Jordan Peterson video where he was basically like, you gotta, you gotta negotiate with yourself. You can't just stack your, your day full of stuff if you're not going to give yourself some time to, to like, you know, basically some downtime to play video games or watch movies or whatever it is you love, because, uh, that, that will be at the detriment to getting the things you need to get done finished to a quality extent. Man, that sentence, the terrible verbiage. I'm just getting pretty tired. I'm trying to sip through some of this coffee. Mm. Oh, yeah. I'm addicted to caffeine. That's for goddamn sure. And that is an addiction I am just reserved to, I guess. You know, now I should take a month break from caffeine at some point. On top of Sober October, where I'm doing no chips, like no crackers, that sort of thing, no snack food, because I'm a goddamn fiend for chips. And I know I'm addicted to them. And, and honestly, that has been at the forefront of my mind more than the weed stuff has. I mean, the only time the weed stuff has come up is like, I'm about to go work on some creative project and I'm like, oh, it's time to smoke. Because that's what I usually do. But, uh, oh, I gotta say, my dreams have been weird. Because if you smoke like I do, you don't dream. Because um, it, like, fucks with your memory or some shit. I don't quite understand it. Now I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna act like I do, but... Uh, but my dreams have been not only weird, they've been violent as fuck. I had a dream, a werewolf in human form, which is just, I mean, what a weird thing. I just knew he was a werewolf, and at one point his eyes flashed yellow to confirm it. He committed a knife murder, and my downstairs came upstairs, dropped the knife into my hand so that my fingerprints would be on it and I would get charged, and then just tried to kill my whole family with like this giant curved Riddick looking blade. And it was like the whole rest of this dream was basically my family like running in circles up and down the stairs, back and forth from the hall, like getting in blows where we could and fucking not trying to not get stabbed by him. And every time we thought we got him, like stabbed him in the stomach, he would just pull out the blade. And the blade ended with me, or the dream ended with me taking that blade and jumping on his back and digging it into his bald head. How fucked up am I? That those are the dreams I'm having when I'm not smoking weed. What's wrong with me? What the fuck is wrong with me, dude? I woke up and was like, Jesus, dude, you've got issues you need to address. Oh, when I told one of my buddies about that, shout out to uh, to my boy Jake, love ya. He was like, yeah, dude, you need to like be in check about the gory shit you're watching. And I was like, that's the thing. I'm not watching gory shit. That's the weirdest fucking part, dude. I mean, I guess I'm always... That gory shit's always in the back of my head because, like I said, that's what I grew up on. Which, again, another great segue. Gotta talk about Sleepy Hollow. Because that, that movie's never left my life with Johnny Depp by Tim Burton. And Danny Elfman does a score. What a beautiful score. Um, and what a haunting score. But uh, but I, I forget how great that movie is until I, I see it again. And I didn't even, like, watch it in full. But my grandma put it on for my niece and nephew. And every time I just came out and saw it, I was like, fucking hey, I forgot how good this is. Really good movie. If you haven't seen that, you gotta watch it. And if you're listening to this, you know who you are. This is strange to me. Not saying it's strange, because I find a lot of things strange. And once I boil it down, it turns out I'm the fucking weirdo. I brought it up. Some, some girl at work asked me what my favorite Halloween movie is. And much to her credit, hers is Hocus Pocus. So... I mean, yeah, anyone who's seen seen that movie knows that uh, that is a phenomenal answer. And I was like, yeah, mine's probably like Nightmare Before Christmas or Sleepy Hollow. She hadn't seen Sleepy Hollow, can't hold that against her. But she didn't even know who the Headless Horseman was. And that, I mean, dude, there's been like 80 different versions of that. I can't imagine not knowing who the Headless Horseman is. That's one of, if not the first, original American folktale. Sleepy Hollow, I believe that's a place in New York. Oh my god. Just like, 
I honestly think it comes from a place of not being like, what? How do you not know what the headless horseman is? But coming from a place of like, dude, you're missing out. Because fuck me. I mean, just the Disney version is so good. I think it's, uh, who did that one crazy famous Christmas album? Bing Crosby or something like that. Um, He voices the Chad of that story, basically. Fuck, what is his name? Let's look this up. Braun. I didn't even have to look it up. His name is Braun. When the spooks come out. No, I can't sing it. Because I'm gonna get copyrighted. Oh my god, I've been talking to myself for over 55 minutes. Well, I honestly think that's a good place to end. I will uh, get this uploaded and you fuckers can listen to it. Peace out, bitches.